I grew up in the woods. I was raised by a single foster parent, Margie, and she was too busy to bother with me. So instead of hanging with my foster siblings, I went into the woods. By the time I could drive, I was spending more time in the woods than I was at home. In all seriousness, I don't think I slept at home one night my senior year. There was something about being in the forest that made me feel at peace. Something that kept Margie's shit parenting at bay. Over those years, I learned nearly everything about the forest that a kid my age could. Foxes sound like people. Cougars are perfect hunters. Bears can climb trees. And the most important thing, if the forest goes silent, something is wrong. If you're going to take anything away from the story, I pray that you make it that. Silence is not good when you're deep in the forest. Like anyone in my situation would, I moved away from home as soon as I could. I packed up my room, loaded up my truck, and found a nice outdoors town by a state over. I was beyond excited when I saw an ad in the newspaper about some trapping gear that someone wanted to sell. Trapping and hunting were some of the better jobs I could work as they paid well. And being born native meant that I could apply for a year-round hunting permit. Plus, it would give me an excuse to live up in the woods and only leave every once in a while with that idea in mind. I called the owner of the gear, his name was Clark, and asked what he was selling and what it might cost. He told me that the set contained eight different traps, an animal call box, snares, knives, and a Winchester 1200. He was selling everything for 2500 I had saved up money that I had made, or that was gifted to me, and being young and dumb, I bought everything. Within a week of buying the gear, I bought my permit, and the state I'm in requires a separate trapping license, so I got that one too. All that set me back another 400, but I was finally ready to live like I wanted to. Clark said that there was a hunting lodge I could stay at. No one owned it, so it was free to stay. People would repair it when it needed to be fixed, and that was about it. From that point on, I became a woodsman, and I lived like that for a few years, spending more time in the woods than in my own apartment. Trapping had actually made me a good amount of money. And when furs and pelts weren't doing too well, the meat and the claws sold well too. I had become accustomed to the noises from the woods, animal calls, god-awful noises, wind blowing through the top layers of the trees. All those sounds became ingrained in me. So now, I guess I'll tell you all why I'm actually writing this. Last weekend, I went up to the lodge to settle in. There was no one at the lodge when I got there, which is pretty normal for midsummer. I'm the only native that hunts up here, so I'm the only one that stays here all year. Aside from a single backpack on one of the beds, the lodge was barren. I set my gear down, grabbed a can of soup, and headed to the kitchen to make myself something to eat. As I walked past one of the windows, I saw something along the edge of the trees. The lodge was in the middle of a circular break in the forest, so the area around the lodge was just open. No canopy, no trees, just grass and ferns. On the edge of the tree line was something. It was a little too dark under the shade of the trees to really make out what it was, but something was definitely there. I tried to study the figure, looking for a shape or some color, but it was too hidden and I came up empty. Eventually, the figure faded out of sight, walking into the deeper part of the woods. As the sun started to go down, the watercolor sky changed from a light blue to a deep purple before fading out into blackness. I took out some of the snares, grabbed my shotgun, and walked out of the lodge. I like to set the snares at night. That way the animals trip them when they wake up to look for food. It just makes more sense. Clicking on the barrel mounted flashlight, I stepped outside. Something instantly felt wrong. Almost like if I was somewhere new. I had walked the woods at night hundreds of times, but they felt unfamiliar now. The wind blew far above the treetops, 
adding an almost musical sound to the surrounding area. After I got a few snares set up, I decided that I would finish the others once the sun came up, and I started walking back to the trail leading to the lodge. On the way, just before I broke the tree line next to the trail, I saw someone walking on the path just out of the reach of my flashlight. He didn't seem to have any gear, and he must have been walking by the light of the moon as I didn't see the beam from a flashlight. Feeling like a bit of a trickster, I clicked my light on and made my way silently back onto the trail. My plan was to sneak up on the guy and scare him. Seeing as he didn't have a gun, I figured I wouldn't get my head blown off. He was pretty far ahead of me, so I tried to walk a little bit faster. But he made it over one of the hills on the trail and left my line of sight. Expecting him to pop back up on the other side any second, I hustled a little bit to close the gap. When I got closer to the hill, a shriek ripped through the nearby woods. I heard every animal in those woods make every noise they could, and I still have no idea what could have let that scream out. It sounded like the call of some ancient, terrible beast. A creature that was far more intelligent than anything else in the woods. I switched my light back on and called out for the man I saw earlier, but he was nowhere to be found. Part of me was hoping he took off running towards the lodge, but every ounce of me knew that I couldn't wait around to check. So I bolted back up the trail, and that's when the horrible noise came tearing through the woods again. That's when it hit me, apart from the noises and my footfalls. The forest was silent. No birds. No small animals, even all the wind had gone away. There was absolutely no noise. My boots stamped against the dirt, kicking up dust and rocks as I tore up the path trying to run. I've been hunted by cougars, bears, wolves, but this time, something felt different. I still felt like something was watching me, burning its eyes in me as I ran. Only instead of it watching out of a territorial need or a need for food, was actually playing with me. Like it was allowing me to keep going. Like it was waiting for me to catch some air. By the time the lodge came into view, another noise, another shriek. This time, it sounded much closer. I pushed the door open and when I spun around to slam the door shut, I saw the same man from earlier. He seemed very calm, and he stopped just as he broke through the tree line. Nothing about him seemed normal. How did he end up behind me? I had been looking ahead the whole time, and I never passed him. Apparently he was right on my heels too, at least if he was that close when I got to the cabin. But I didn't hear him behind me. When he started to walk, I slammed the door shut and locked it. Whatever he was. He wasn't getting in here. Using my flashlight, I went around and turned all the lights in the lodge on, and then checked all the windows and entrances. Once the place was secured, I sat down on a bed and tried to sleep it off, thinking that the sun would force whatever I heard to retreat. Within seconds of snoozing, I was woken up by the sound of banging on a window. The grogginess of my sleep was wearing off as I neared the source of the banging. From afar, I could make out a vague, white shape in the window. The longer I stared, the more clear it became. It was the exact same guy from earlier, face pressed against the glass, with his hand banging on the window. Hoping that I could just walk up and ask what he wanted, I started to walk ahead, slowly. When I got within an arm's length of the window, the man stopped slamming his hand into the window. And instead, his jaw dropped. At first it stayed at a normal distance, but after a while, his jaw began to crack and it descended even further down. His mouth was hanging open and I noticed the sound, quiet at first, coming from his throat. It was a low, deep groan. After a few seconds of groaning, a voice came from him. Open window. That's all he said. Nothing more. Nothing less. 
He was just repeating that line over and over. Open window. Open window. Open window. No emotion. I told him to fuck off. That I wasn't gonna die because he wanted to come in. When he didn't back off, I turned and grabbed my shotgun, walked back up, and placed the barrel against the window. Open window. Open window. He began to shake like he was having a violent seizure, twitching, maybe from the cold, maybe from something else. That's when the same piercing shriek from earlier came out of the dark hole that was his throat, and he slipped away in the darkness, leaving the window. I was able to get a little bit of sleep that night, but I was briefly awoken a few times by more noises and more shrieks. When the sun had started to creep up through the sky the next morning, I checked all the windows and then deemed it safe enough to go outside. Circling the lodge, I noticed a few things. Footprints leading from the same window that this man or thing was at back to the forest. And on the other side of the same window were deep scratches. Other than that, the surrounding area was normal. Nothing out of the ordinary. I was feeling safe enough to be able to walk down to the trail and to my truck. So I grabbed my gear and noticed that the same backpack was still there. It had been there since I got to the lodge. And I figured that someone might have left it up there and forgot about it. I figured I would grab it and leave an ad in the paper about it. I loaded up the backpack and left the lodge, not even bothering to check on the snares. The trail seemed longer than it had ever been before, and the hiking down felt uneasy. But it wasn't until I got within sight of my truck that I really lost it. Just as I came to the part where the trail opens up, I decided to take one last look into the woods. And behind a fallen tree, I saw him. The same man from earlier, standing there, watching me. I tossed my gear in the back, jumped in the truck and drove off. As I sped down the road back to town, I noticed something in the woods alongside the car, just ahead of me. Looking outwards towards the road was the same man. But something about him looked different. His arms seemed to hang down to his knees, and his face looked more sunken. Fearing that he would find a way into the car, I floored the gas and hoped there wouldn't be any state troopers out. I got back to town and headed home. I needed to rest, and a few days later, I decided to head to City Hall and turn in the backpack and warn someone about what I had seen. Before I even got to the permit section of the building, I was stopped by the lady at the front desk. She asked me if I'd been out by the lodge, and I told her yes. She asked me to wait in the lobby, and I agreed. After a few minutes, the sheriff showed up and asked to talk with me. Apparently a day or two before I went into the woods, there had been an animal attack. A hiking group of three people. One died, one was missing, and the one that made it back really bad. The sheriff wanted to know if I saw any strange animal activities, and I told him what happened. Instead of disbelief and a laugh, he asked me to take a look at a picture and see if I recognized it. When he took the picture out of his pocket, I almost had a panic attack. It was the same man I had seen in the forest. It looked like a driver's license photo or something. The sheriff wasn't surprised when I told him that was the same man. He actually thanked me and left the building. I wanted to just forget about everything like it never happened to go on with my life and keep living how I'm used to but there's one issue sometimes when I look out my window at night I swear I see the same man but now his arms are far longer than any human arm and his jaw still hangs loose and open I think it followed me from the trail, and I'm not sure what to do.
When I was eight years old, both of my parents worked full time. My dad was on third shift at his job, and my mom was a school teacher. We lived right up the road from my grandparents in a very small town. It was getting close to my ninth birthday when I got strep throat and scarlet fever. I ended up severely sick. I could barely speak, had the first case of cold sweats that I remember in my life, and could barely pull myself out of bed to even use the restroom. My poor mother was at a loss of what to do with her working and my dad needing to use daylight hours to sleep. The first day I was sick, my dad stayed up most of the day with me, made me food, wiped my forehead down, made sure I took my medicine, and everything else. But on the second day, my grandmother had called and offered to let me stay at her house so my dad could sleep. He said yes and woke me up around 7 that morning to drive me up to her place. My grandfather also worked at this time as well, so he was already gone to work when I got there. I don't remember too much of the early morning. I must have just slept in my grandmother's bed, tossing and turning, when I would wake up feeling extra bad. She encouraged me to swallow my awful tasting medicine, a little more gently than my dad did at least. She did fix me some tomato soup to try to eat, and it was the first time since I got in sick that I had an appetite. I should mention that my grandmother had this little small dog named Samson. Samson came into the room and crawled up next to me as I dozed off. I do know when I woke up at some point, it had to be the early afternoon lunch time because I could hear the TV from the living room on some game show. My grandmother had a ritual of eating her lunch while watching a game show. I think it was The Price is Right. I was trying to fall back asleep because I got this really bad headache coming. Maybe from dehydration. I was on the edge of falling asleep when I suddenly woke up by Samson scream that erupted from the living room. The dog curled up next to my feet perked up but didn't move. I knew I heard his name being called, but it was strange. He didn't respond. Samson, my grandma called again. Samson, the dog still didn't run out of the room to her. I was confused as he was obedient to my grandmother. He was almost frozen, staring at the cracked open door, but making no attempt to go to her. She called again, Samson, Maybe three or four more times. Samson. 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 Then, I actually got annoyed. I remember flinging the covers off of me. Of course, all of my clothes is sticky with sweat, and I just feel uncomfortable and groggy. I stumble out of the room, wiping my eyes and asking, Grandma, do you need Samson? He's in your room with me. I'm in the living room, and I have to do a double take. The TV... It's still on and loud. There's a bowl of soup sitting on the coffee table and also an open Pepsi next to it. But my grandmother isn't anywhere in the room. Maybe she's in the bathroom. I crossed the room and went past the kitchen, but it was empty too. I got to the bathroom door which was shut. Nothing. I then opened it. No one was in there. The house is empty. It's not a huge house either. I went by through every single room. So yeah, my first reaction was to get scared. I could clearly hear my grandmother calling for the dog, but she's not anywhere inside. I can feel my hands and feet get all tingly. I start shouting for my grandma, but my voice is just echoing through the small cramped home. Samson had gotten up at this point and was sitting near the couch, looking completely undisturbed. I fumble for the remote and turn the TV off and yelled to the top of my lungs, which you can imagine how painful this was with a scratchy infected throat. Grandma, the worst part happened next. That's when I heard my grandma shouting my name back, clear as ever, like she was standing only feet away. I start crying now, scared out of my mind. I feel like maybe it has to be a ghost. I grew up with scary ghost stories courtesy of my dad and I'm convinced now that I'm in the room with a ghost. And then she, whatever this was, proceeded to call my name again. Then, there was a second voice. Definitely not my grandmother's. 
It was deeper, definitely more masculine and terrifying, as it said, Come to the front door. Of course I didn't go. Instead, I made sure to run back to my grandparents' bedroom, lock the door, and pick up the telephone on their nightstand. I called my own home phone and my dad's sleepy voice answer. Through a barely comprehensible voice, I managed to croak something like, Dad, there's someone in the house and I can't find Grandma. She's gone. My dad, of course, said he jumped out of bed, grabbed his army knife he kept in a drawer next to the bed, and ran down the road to the house in his PJs and bare feet. He ran up to the front door, jiggled the handle. It was locked. So he made his way around and since he knew the garage code, just punched it in and got inside. A quick sweep of the three rooms of the home showed no one was in there. It's not like there was really anywhere to hide. I ran out of the room once I was sure he was there and began crying in his arms. He kept reassuring me that there was no one here and then he asked if I knew where grandma was at. I said I didn't and explained that I woke up to her calling for Samson but she hadn't been anywhere there. This was back when cell phones were definitely around but there were no iPhones and my grandparents weren't going to be buying them anyways. My dad had a cell phone but he didn't have it on him at the time. I could tell he was trying to keep calm so he just said we would need to go back to our house. I was sure he was going to call the police at that point just because my grandma still hadn't popped up and her vehicle was still in the driveway when he got in. If she had left, she must have gone on foot. We hadn't even made two steps out of the driveway when from my grandma's neighbor's house, my grandma was strolling out, talking to the neighbor. She then saw my dad and then she saw me crying my eyes out and immediately ran over to see what was wrong. She was super apologetic. She said she had stepped out right when she had heated up her soup to go see her neighbor who had called about looking at something that my grandma was going to buy. My grandma figured I was asleep and she thought she would only be gone for 10 or 15 minutes. At first, people may have assumed I was feverish, therefore confused, but I still stand by what happened. I know for a fact I was definitely alone in the house with Samson. But the voices I heard were real. For a while, I refused to go back to my grandma's house because this happened in the middle of the fucking day. I later read stories at school about Wendigos or the creatures that would disguise their voices to draw people. This was the best explanation I could ever form about what I heard. I never shared to anyone that I thought it was for sure a Wendigo and chalked it up to maybe just a ghost. I'm close to my 20s now. Last year was the first time I shared the story fully to my grandpa, who actually just used to say, the fever you had must have made you had bad dreams. We were sitting on the front porch of the house, smoking cigarettes and exchanging stories. When I finished telling him, for the first time he looked sort of disturbed about it. He finally put his cigarette out and just stared out into the road. Then he cleared his throat and looked over to me. You know, he said slowly, some funny things used to happen around that time in the middle of the night. I would wake up to take a piss or something. When I would first sit up in the bed, I could hear your grandma sleeping away, snoring. He chuckled but his face grew serious again. Anyways. I would always hear her calling for the dog. I tried to remain looking calm, but my voice still shook when I asked, even when she was sleeping, sleep talking? Uh, no. He shook his head. I listened. I actually heard her calling from outside, maybe the living room. She would call for the dog. She would call my name, all while she was really sleeping next to me, sleeping like a baby. Well, have you ever told anyone? No, I don't want to scare her. She's real scared of ideas like ghosts. That's why when you were younger and this thing happened, I told her just to remember you've been sick, fever and all. Most likely having nightmares. 
He looked gravely at me. Don't repeat this to her, please. She's really not the type to be scaring. I wanted to cry. I had this itchy, creepy feeling suddenly about being at the house. Hey, Grandpa, do you still hear it sometimes? Of course, I still do. He was now reaching into his breast pocket to get out another cigarette. I hear him every night. But you just gotta remember not to do what it says. Even the dog figured this out. If it says come to the door, you stay away from the door. If it says come here, you just stay still in the room until it quits calling. And with that, he asked to borrow my lighter again. I have a story. It's not mine, but it happened to my uncle. He used to tell this story when we went camping, and it scared the lights out of me every time I heard it. We live in Utah, and my uncle Mark went on a mission at 19. They sent him to a native reservation in Arizona. They paired them up with a companion named Carl. When they first got there, there was a huge argument with the locals on the reservation about them going there. They didn't want my uncle and Carl staying on the res. Eventually, they came to a compromise that they would stay on the outskirts in a trailer. This reservation wasn't very big and was located next to a wooded area. The first night, they were trying to sleep when all of a sudden their trailer started to shake violently back and forth. Startled and not sure what was happening, they climbed under the table for cover. Mark could hear someone pushing it from both sides of the trailer, like a group of people. And then, after about five minutes, it stopped. The next day, they made rounds on the res and were talking to the locals. Carl made a comment to one of the families that their trailer was shaking the night before. The family got very quiet and then told him they had to leave. They thought it was pretty strange, but they didn't think much of it. The next night it happened again. They were awakened by the trailer shaking back and forth. Again, they climbed under the table until it stopped. This went on for two more nights. Anytime they tried to talk to anyone about it, they got quiet and told them they had to leave. Mark started thinking that because of their arrival, the locals were doing this to scare them off the res. They then went into a store and they were talking together about how frustrated they were with the situation. The clerk overheard and said, they can't talk about it, it's forbidden. Confused, they asked, can't talk about what? The guy continues to tell them about the skinwalkers. He says they are evil demons that were once Native American witches. If they talk about it, the skinwalkers will come for their souls. They just walked out of their baffled. They thought the clerk was just trying to scare them. So that night, when the shaking started again, my uncle decided to be brave and confront them. He went to the trailer door, flew it open, and yelled. When he did that, he saw three animals run off. Two were a wolf, one was a bear. However, they looked strange, almost with human features. As he watched them run towards the trees, all three of them stood up on two legs and walked slowly towards the trees, making a human cackling laugh. It scared him so bad that they called their mission president that next morning and asked to be moved. They were relocated that day, and for a year, nothing happened. One day, they announced that Carl was being relocated to another city, and Mark was getting a new companion named Jimmy. They had to drive for about an hour to pick Jimmy up from the airport. The road they traveled went through the boundaries of the res. They arrived at 8 p.m. and picked him up. The mission president tells Jimmy, We're driving through a dangerous area at night, so we can't make any stops. If you need to use the restroom, you need to go now. Jimmy then says that he's fine. The mission president gets serious enough to even freak out Mark. I'm not kidding. Go do your business. Jimmy was insistent he was fine, 
so they hit the road. As they were about 30 minutes into the drive, they were going through the area of the reservation boundaries. Jimmy starts complaining that he needed a pee so bad. The mission president says, We can't stop here. You're going to have to hold it. Jimmy keeps going on. I seriously can't hold it anymore. So the mission president stops the car and says, But you will do your business next to the door. And if I say get in the car, you need to get in the car fast. Jimmy was looking confused and said, Alright. And then he opens the door and starts to do his business. About five seconds later, the mission president says nothing and just pulls Jimmy into the car and floors it. Jimmy and Mark start freaking out. What's going on? The mission president says nothing and just increases his speed. All of a sudden, Mark sees something next to the car to his right. A giant wolf-looking man was running on two feet next to the vehicle. Mark then looked over at the gauges. They were going over 60 miles an hour and still going faster. The wolf creature kept right next to the car for 10 minutes until it finally took off into the trees. Shaking, Jimmy gets out of the car when they arrive. They didn't speak after this whole situation. And then he says, What did I just see? The mission president says, Next time I tell you to take care of your business, you need to take care of your business. I woke up yesterday morning very comfortable and restored from a full night's sleep. It was going to be a good day. I could tell. I heard the familiar sound of my mom fumbling around with her keys that she did every morning before she left for work. See you after work, she yelled from the door. I was so comfy in bed but couldn't get back to sleep because I slept so long last night. So I got up and just played video games for a while. Everything seemed normal that day. I let my dogs out and sat on my bed playing on my laptop. I got hungry like any teenager does and went to my kitchen to get some food. I walked into the kitchen and was shocked at what I saw. Every single cupboard door was open and there was a row of bowls perfectly in line on the counter. I yelled for my dad who I thought made this mess but then I realized that he was at work too. I thought nothing of this and just put all the dishes back. It was about 4.30, normally the time my mom gets home, when my front door opened. I yelled down from my room, Hey mom, but I got no response. Normally she is always happy to be greeted by me, so I was confused. I ran down to see what was wrong, but nothing was there. Now, I was starting to get worried. Then I heard, Hey Jake, from behind me. It was a monotone voice, nothing like my mom's. I turned around and my mom was there. Well, physically she was here. However, she just stood there staring at me, with her head cocked to the left ever so slightly. Her eyes were open wide, and her smile was huge. So I said, hey, in a puzzled tone, and she responded with, where is dad, in that same monotone voice. I responded, he's at work, just like he is every day at this time. I was starting to get freaked out. Very good, she said. Then she turned around and walked out the door. I was really scared at that moment. To make it worse, my phone started ringing. I picked it up and it was my mom. Hey honey, I'll be home soon. I got stuck in a meeting at work. What do you want for dinner? I just dropped the phone and ran out the back door. Now I'm at my grandma's house with my mom and we don't know what to do. It's like 5 a.m. and I have no intentions of sleeping. I'm not sure what came to my house earlier, but it really scared me. Why did that thing want to know where my dad was? I need to get all this sorted out, so I'll leave you off here for now. I'll update you all if I find out more about the situation. Every summer, when my sister and I were young, my dad would set up a tent in the backyard. I have fond memories of afternoons spent playing in our super secret clubhouse. To enter, visitors have to either recite the password 
or pay a reasonable entrance fee, one cookie per club member. The tent was ours, and ours alone, and we could leave it in a big mess as we wanted to, without getting scolded. Comics, toys, blankets, and even clothes were scattered about on the floor, but neither of us minded the chaos. On rare occasions, Dad would let us spend the night alone in the tent. Those nights were special to us, as they were the only times we got to do anything outdoors, you can say. We lived in the city, and the closest we got to nature was a small forest separating our yard from the neighbor's home. The trees were so thin and far apart from one another that we could clearly see through the other side. It barely even qualified as a forest, but despite this, I learned one night that something could hide in it, just out of sight. And that night was the last I ever spent in the tent. It happened when I was about nine years old. I woke up one morning to the sound of my dad shutting the attic door. The noise could only mean one of two things. Either he wanted to go down memory lane and wanted to look at our family albums, or it was time for the tent to come up. I ran out into the hall, only to see him pulling the lumpy bag that contained our childhood fort. My dad smiled as I squealed and bounced with excitement. While my sister and I were eating breakfast, he slaved away in the backyard, pitching the old patchy tent onto the freshly cut grass. From time to time, we would hear him curse, but whenever we looked out the window, he would just smile and wave. He wanted to make us happy, so he would hide his frustrations as best as he could. In hindsight, he could have spared himself a lot of grief if he had taken the time to find the assembly instructions, but he always managed to figure it out on his own, eventually. We knew we were in for a special treat when my father disappeared in the garage, only to return with an extension cord and the small TV that used to belong to the kitchen counter. It had broken a few months back, but my dad had found a way to repair it. He ran the extension cord from the socket near the sliding glass patio door all the way into the tent where he then plugged the TV. Upon his return, he said that my sister and I were going to have a special movie night. We were excited. That night, Dad brought us popcorn, candy, and some hot chocolate. He kissed us goodnight and left us to our marathon of Disney tapes. We fell asleep to the sound of crickets chirping outside and animals singing on screen. It must have been near midnight when I woke up. My bladder almost exploding from all the hot chocolate I had drunk earlier. It was quiet outside. If not for the sound of the static coming from the TV, I would have thought someone had swallowed all the outdoor noise. Just as I started to unzip my sleeping bag, the motion sensor porch light suddenly came to life, casting both bright rays and a strange shadow on the wall of the tent. Dad, I asked weakly, rubbing the sleep from my eyes. That's when I heard an unnatural shriek in response, unlike the call of an eagle. Though the sound was lower and more drawn out, I examined the shadow. Its proportions were stretched and exaggerated, as though someone had made a semblance of a human out of pipe cleaners. As the distorted shape drew near, I fearfully reached a hand towards my sister, shaking her sleeping bag. She was tucked in all the way with only her dark matted hair sticking out from the top. She had always been a heavy sleeper, so when she fell to awaken, I wasn't surprised. Dumping sounds resonated on the porch as the figure moved. It began to circle around the tent. As terrifying as its shadow was, it was more terrifying to lose it from view every time it reached the back of the tent. Little by little, the stalker walked around circles around the tent drawing even near with each rotation until it was within arm's reach. Its fingertips, or what I assume were fingertips, crept along the fabric, producing a noise like paper being torn. Fortunately, it didn't seem capable of piercing the protective mesh. Suddenly, the TV jerked violently towards the tent's entrance. The thing was pulling on the extension cord. The zipper began to unravel as the power cord lifted against it. I dove towards the TV as swiftly as I could and unplugged it. There was so much tension on the cord that my actions caused the form to fall back with an anger shriek. This time, I heard my sister moving. 
I barely had time to process what happened. When I saw something slide into the tent from the small opening it had just made, its texture was unlike anything I had ever seen or have ever seen since then. I would say it was similar to a lizard scales, only more porous. My instincts made me smash the TV against the finger, causing it to retract. Quickly I pulled the zipper back down to the ground, only to feel the creature pulling it in the opposite direction. It wanted to get in, but I wasn't going to let it. I may have been just a child, but I was stronger than I looked. In the midst of all my issues growing up that I had, my father once tried to lock me in a room, despite the fact that a grown man was holding the door shut. I still managed to crack it open a few times by sheer force of uncontrolled will. Now, I was doing the same, but with a flimsy zipper instead. A snap resounded in the backyard, and once again, the creature fell and shrieked. I could only determine that the slider on its end had broken. Its ear-piercing noises made me quiver. I felt paralyzed, but I kept my hands firmly in place. My sister, on the other hand, merely turned over in her sleeping bag. As I sat there in fear, I heard the creature's footsteps head towards the woods, where they grew more distant. Even when the motion sensor lights finally turned off ten minutes later, I remained vigilant never letting go of the zipper inside the tent. I imagined myself as a brave soldier, protecting its post, until I eventually passed out from being tired. When morning came, I could still see my sister snoozing in her sleeping bag. That's when I flew out of the tent, zipping it back up behind me. I felt like she would be safe in the light of day, and I would be able to go get my dad. However, as I reached the patio door, I saw my sister, sitting at the kitchen table, smiling while swinging her legs while she scooped up her favorite cereal. The sound of the zipper slowly opening behind me brought a wave of fear to my chest. My head turned slowly towards the tent, just in time to catch a glimpse of something running into the woods away from my house. Something with black matted hair and strange proportions. It was gone in a flash, but from what little I could see of it, I could tell it was smaller than what had been outside my tent earlier. My sister had woken up long before me that night. The click of the VHS tape coming to an end had actually woken her up, and she had gone to sleep inside, where it was warm. My cousin lived in the East Agency of the Navajo Nation, in a community known as Crown Point. She was still living with her parents at this time, and was a good girl. She had good grades, a nice ride, and was very popular that she even played on the basketball team. When she told us this story, it was very creepy, and the events that follow would also deepen my beliefs in the traditional Navajo way and the Navajo culture. My cousin was coming home from basketball practice, which ran past sunset. It was during the colder months and so it was dark by the time she pulled into her neighborhood. She pulled into the small housing community that she lived in. It was far from a fenced community, but there were street lights, and the neighbors weren't too far from one another. As she got closer home, she saw a group of dogs. This wasn't unlikely as there are random packs of stray dogs that roam the communities. These dogs don't belong to anyone, and they get food from wherever they can. As she got closer, she noticed that something was off about the dogs. There were four dogs, and they were all sitting in a circle, all facing each other. Surprisingly, this really didn't face her until she spoke about the event later. Since this was a housing community, my cousin couldn't barrel down the road, so she slowly drove past the group of dogs and kept going on her way. As she continued to drive, she noticed from the corner of her eye that something was running alongside her car. She turned her head to see that a brown dog from the group was trotting alongside her car. This actually didn't face her until she hit a speed bump and the impact of the bump made her car wobble. She looked over at the dog again still casually keeping pace with the car. She tried to ignore the dog and try speeding up, 
Keeping in mind where the speed bumps are, the dog continued to keep pace as well. My cousin had to eventually stop at a stop sign. She began to feel uncomfortable and tried keeping her eyes ahead, but curiosity got the best of her. She looked over at the dog. It was facing straight ahead. She continued to stare, and that's when the dog turned its head. But instead of the face of a dog, there was the flat face of a man covered in hair and smiling from ear to ear. Fear shot through her body and my cousin pushed the pedal to the floor, not daring to look back. She finally got home and barely pulled herself in the door, weak from fear. My auntie came to her and my cousin began to sob. She told my auntie everything and they scheduled a meeting with a medicine man the very next day. That same night, my cousin was trying to get some rest. She was tossing and turning and felt very ill. She could hear people outside laughing and talking in Navajo, but she didn't think too much of it because they lived in a community near plenty of neighbors. The next day, the medicine man told my cousin that she was very fortunate. He said that the skinwalker wasn't meant for her. The medicine man told her that she just happened to spot it when it was out to bring another person misfortune. He also told her that the laughing and talking that she heard in the night was the skinwalker talking to his friends and that he had scared her. The medicine man told my cousin that if the skinwalker had been for her and she had seen him like that, it could have very well killed her. After that encounter, my cousin suffered from being very ill and she actually had to stop playing basketball for a while. She had many ceremonies and even a cleansing performed on her and she eventually got back on her feet. This is one of many stories that my mom always tells us about, especially when electricity goes out at night. When I ask my cousin about it, she confirms it's true, but she also doesn't like talking about it too much. She also told me that the medicine man told her not to go around and telling people about this experience because apparently these skinwalkers can hear you and you're basically drawing them to your home. So this will be the only time that you hear from me. Whether you believe the story or not, I would recommend not talking about skinwalkers with other people. The nighttime brought two rules we had to live by, no matter what family you come from. You are to not look outside or be outside. This one night brought my brother to sneak out to meet a girl who lived nearby. Teenage stuff, if you get what I'm saying. Anyways, the later hours of the night and he's sneaking back through his window. As he's getting ready to pull himself in from the absolute darkness of the night, he heard my dog growling a few feet behind him. The dog we had at the time was from a known, highly aggressive breed but to hear him growling came as a surprise to my brother. He claimed to call out soft to the dog, but the dog was unresponsive. After a few seconds, my brother slowly began walking towards the dog, and as he got closer, the smallest glint of light hit my dog's face. As his face softly lit, my brother realized that the dog was not looking at him but the area of the roof right above his bedroom window. As he slowly turned and looked at the empty space, he began to recognize that heart-sinking feeling of somebody or something watching him, along with the sounds like if something was sitting perched on the edge of the roof. The more time went by, the more dread he felt. He was so scared that he rushed through his window and to our mother, panicking and telling her what he did and what was going on. She was so scared she wasn't even bothered by the fact he snuck out. I remember watching and listening from my bedroom door and seeing her turn pale and begin to shake. She told him to never do it again and to keep his window closed. It was from that day on that not only our neighbors but people from the complete opposite side of the community began to open up about their experiences with the thing that walks among us at night on the roofs of the house. One of which includes a close relative 
who was home alone with an aunt. One night, she claimed to begin hearing something clawing and walking on the roof. When she noticed it, she said it was like it noticed her or knew she was there. Because when she tried to find a room to shield herself in, the footsteps followed right above. Think of your ceiling made out of glass and this thing always knowing exactly where your foot is falling and the exact moment you extend your foot there is another step. It wasn't until I reached my 20s that I began experiencing this creature on a weekly. Yes, I said weekly and I am not exaggerating. It was like clockwork especially once snow began falling. Heavy footsteps before the sun was up that woke me up around 5 a.m. at least once a week. Here and there those footsteps would be substituted for what I only imagine is a grown man in steel toed boots running with what sounded like chains dragging. I was so desperate for sleep and to not be bothered that I started putting holy water on my ceiling but it seemed to only hold off whatever this being was for a few days before coming back again. As time went by not only did my neighbor, but the residents who lived several houses away would tell my family about their experiences with the thing that lurked on top of our houses. One neighbor was simply sitting in the living room when he began to hear like somebody was walking above him. He said it left him paralyzed with fear and all he could do was sit and stare in horror at the area above him. Another friend who lived three houses down was taking out her garbage when she heard walking right above her doorway and left her so scared she ran inside and refused to be out at night for months. I can go on and on about the stories that left our friends, family, and neighbors shaken to the core for hours, but for now, this seems to be the most nightmarish creatures our people have continuously shared the space with since we were forced into colonization. Even though these stories and these experiences can spark a lot of interest in seeking out these beings. I simply ask that no one actually take the time to. You never know what might follow you and make your home its home as well. Maybe those noises you hear in your attic at night when you're going to sleep are actually coming from your roof and maybe it's something that has followed you already because of these stories and these experiences that you dig into. If you think you have one of these things making your home their home, I would recommend to call a priest or a medicine man, somebody who's familiar with these things, because if not, next time, it might be outside your window. Let me start off by saying my husband is native and this happened about six years before I met him. My ex-husband was stationed in San Diego and I flew out there to visit him. Unfortunately, I wasn't allowed to stay with him on the base for whatever reason. Don't ask me because I don't even know myself. Also, I should add I had just given birth about three months before this and I had my son with me. I found a hotel that wasn't far from the base and close to food and whatnot. I went out to get some food and then walked back to the hotel since it wasn't far. Unfortunately, with my horrible sense of direction, I got lost and ended up near a wooded area. But there was a highway also nearby. It was getting close to sunset and I started seeing sets of shining eyes and I thought they were just coyotes. I'm not afraid so much. After about 20 minutes, one set of shining eyes got closer and I saw it was a coyote. I remember watching Steve Irwin as a teenager and remember that if you make yourself appear bigger and more loud than you actually are, they will most of the time run off. So I started clapping my hands and shouting. This one however didn't. It actually stood up and started walking like a person. I have never run away from something so fast. It never followed me and I wasn't going to stick around to find out what it was. It wasn't until I met my current husband 
that I found out what it was. And the look on his face when I told him this story. He actually went pale. He never said anything. He just kind of nodded like he understood. Maybe it knew I was still semi-healing from having recently given birth. Or it saw my son in the stroller I was pushing and just wanted to scare me. Either way, I don't know. I just know that it succeeded in scaring me. This isn't really a question. It's more or less me telling the story of how I saw a skinwalker. And I didn't even know what it was at the time. Back in college, a buddy and I were hanging out in our dorm room, smoking some weed and chilling. We got on the topic of creepy pastas and stuff, and I mentioned that I heard some really creepy skinwalker stories. That's when my buddy gets really quiet all of a sudden. I saw one, once, up close and personal. That shit is real, bro. Of course, I told him to tell me more but he said he didn't like talking about it, but eventually opened up. So his story took place back in the summer before he left for college. Him and his high school friend group had planned one big last camping trip. He was from Scottsdale, Arizona, and I think he said they only drove a good hour and a half outside the city to one of their friend's parents' ranching properties. There's about eight people in their group and everyone shows up around the same time in three separate cars. Around when they show up, it's already starting to get dark, so they set up their tents and a campfire and start drinking and smoking. This one dude in their group, let's call him Tim, is being a little more quiet than usual. My buddy then asks, what's wrong? And he says something like, I don't feel good. Just a little under the weather today. Regardless, they start making brats and they're all having a good time. Then, out of nowhere, everyone notices that Tim is gone. Just totally vanished. Nobody even saw him leave, even though everyone was relatively close to the fire. The group starts calling his name, thinking that he's pranking everyone. Then, they start to get worried once Tim has been gone for over an hour. So my friend and a couple others go out into the hills to search for him. They walk around a good 15 minutes calling his name before they finally get a response. However, it's not Tim. They hear the familiar sound of a coyote and it's answered by a couple other coyotes. My buddy then says that he starts to get worried at this point that Tim my had gotten dragged off by some wild animals. Everyone in their group was paranoid because there's no way Tim could have gone missing without anyone noticing. Just simply no way. Then they hear another howl, but it's longer than the others and different in that it sounds off. Like if someone had a recording of a coyote and decided to play it. My friend's blood ran cold when the howl ended in a sort of hacking laughter. And unlike the coyotes, this laughter sounded close. Like 20 feet away close. The group then starts looking around, convinced that Tim is out there fucking with them. After a few minutes, they return to the fire a little shaken up. Everyone is really starting to get worried at this point. The group starts considering calling the police when suddenly a truck pulls up to the campsite. It happens to be Tim's truck. Then Tim steps out of it and is wondering why everyone has been freaking out. Tim says that he's sorry that he got off work two hours late and hurried out to the ranch as fast as he could. Then that's when the group realizes that Tim didn't carpool there with anyone. All of a sudden, they hear another long, drawn out coyote sound. At that point, the group decided to get out of there. 
They then ended up paying to camp in a designated campground, and the night went on as normal. But my friend still says he thinks about when he asked him if he was alright. He claims that at the time he could definitely tell something was off about Tim, but they didn't think anything of it. But now he's 100% convinced that, quote unquote, Tim was some sort of skinwalker entity copying his friend for shits and giggles. How the creature knew what Tim looked and sounded like, well, he has no explanation for that. Maybe it just got inside their heads. So be careful when you go camping with some friends out in the woods and one of them starts acting strange. This person might actually not be your friend. This incident took place when I was 17. I was with my family. We were going through the mountains near Window Rock, Arizona. It was late at night and all around us as we drove was darkness and tall trees. We were in a pickup truck. I was sitting in the front with my sister and her husband who was driving. My two brothers and cousin were sitting back in the bed. All of a sudden, this thing or creature runs out in front of us and across the headlights. At the moment, I thought it was a deer. My brother-in-law, Eddie, said it was a coyote. It happened so fast, but just in case, we do say a prayer. After a few minutes, we soon forgot about it, driving along and talking. When up in front of us, there, just standing in the middle of the county road, are four more coyotes. Now, I've seen a lot of coyotes out where we live, but rarely do we see them more than two at a time, and even less sitting in the road. Eddie slows the truck, but they stay right there almost as if they're daring him. Then, when it looks like he's going to have to stop or hit them, they walk away towards the shoulder and disappear into the trees. Eddie then makes a remark that something spooky is going on and he wants to get home as soon as possible. But my sister tells him better safe than sorry and not to go too fast. Now the only thing worse to us Navajos than coyotes appearing out of nowhere is the hoot of the owl. While most of the time it's no big deal, just all looking birds hunting for mice. When you hear them the way we did, something's not right. It could mean that someone close to you is in danger. The fact is, if they are hunting, they are most likely quiet. Anyways, we start hearing these owl hoots, one after the other, as if they are calling ahead, alerting some dark entity that we are on our way. More curious than that, there were six of us in that truck, and I know I counted six hoots. The turnoff from the county road is a dirt road, and it is less than 10 minutes from our house. Eddie is driving along going a little faster than my sister is comfortable with. Looking back over my shoulder, I can see the rest of them there in the bed, bouncing and sliding around a little bit. Only a minute or two down the road, we can see the lights from the houses still in the distance but close enough where we're all feeling better about things but before we get there Eddie slams on the brakes and yanks the truck to the left I see something big and black and definitely upright right in front of us despite Eddie's efforts the truck runs right into it we hit it so hard that it sounded like a gun going off I was holding on tight to the door and seat, but I could hear the rest of my family being thrown around in the back. They were screaming and cursing. Eddie then managed to get control of the vehicle pretty fast. When it stopped, I jumped out to make sure my two brothers and my cousin were okay. They were only banged up a little bit, 
which is more than I can say for the pickup. The whole nose was total. The only thing still intact was one headlight, which was still lit up. As we're standing around the truck, we're all looking to the right of the road, where less than six feet away is this six foot high chain link fence that runs along the shoulder in both directions as far as the eye can see. The woods beyond the fence go all the way back into the hills. The point is that there is no way that whatever we hit took off in that direction or even came at us from that way. Basically, it came out of nowhere as if it loomed up from the surface of the road itself or dropped down out of the sky. Meanwhile, Eddie was taking a closer look at the damage. It was, after all, his truck. He noticed that there was some skin, hair, and blood on what remained of the grill. Along the lip of the hood, and even by the light fixture that was broken, convinced that whatever it was, it was hurt and possibly crumpled up nearby. We looked around up and down the road and off to the shoulder to the left, but we found nothing. As it was really dark and things were kind of eerie, we decided we would come back when the sun was up and look around. We all piled back in the truck, but Eddie couldn't get it to start. He would turn the key in the ignition and not even get a sound, as if there was no battery. The funny thing though, is that one headlight was still on. Go figure. No sooner had Eddie finished cursing and punching the steering wheel, when we hear off in the darkness, and in the trees to the left, some whistling and laughing as if someone is playing games with us. One second it seems to be coming from over here, the next second from over there, and then after that from back a ways. It went on like this for like 10 minutes. My sister tells us that it's a skinwalker, and then she starts whispering Navajo prayers. By this time only my sister is still in the truck, Eddie and I are standing by the bed on the driver's side and my other two brothers and cousin are in bed. My older brother Nicky is unafraid. He thinks that it's just some idiot in the woods and volunteers to run to the house and come back with my father's car. The house is less than a mile away. No sooner does he start jogging off, we hear the same laughing and whistling go with him as if he is being followed. He told us later that he was aware of it, and even though he thought he heard his name being whispered, he just kept jogging along all the same. About 10 minutes later, we see these headlights coming towards us. It was Nikki. When we all got back to the house, Eddie called the sheriff to report the accident. It was super late, but he told Eddie he would meet him there and have a look just in case somebody did get hit. I went back with Eddie in my dad's car. The sheriff showed up a few minutes later. He had one of those industrial flashlights, but as much as he looked around, he couldn't find anything either. He agreed by the look of the hair left behind that whatever we hit, it wasn't a deer. When we told him about the whistling and laughing, his whole demeanor sort of changed. It was obvious that he was no longer interested in standing out there in the dark. He went back to his car and wrote out one of those little accident reports and gave it to Eddie. The next day my mother had a friend of hers come to the Hogan. She was this really old woman that we were afraid of, of when we were kids. She had this small crystal, sort of pale yellow in color that she held up and looked through as if she could see into the past. She told my mother there was a fierce battle of wills between a local medicine man and a skinwalker last night. And that if it wasn't for the medicine man distracting the skinwalker, all six of us would have died when the truck went out of control and hit the trees. She never did tell us who that medicine man was or the skinwalker. 
though she did tell us that she knew them both. And interesting enough, when Eddie went back for the truck the next morning, it started right up without a problem. So if you're ever traveling through a Navajo res or Navajo nation or around here at night, pray to whatever gods you have that your car does not stop and that you don't run into any dog, coyote, deer, or any animal. This happened back in 2016 or so. My ex at the time and I were road tripping around Utah. We started in Seagull Canyon by Thompson Springs north of Crescent Junction. It's a very cool, creepy spot with Native American rock art dating back to right around 2000 BC, almost 4,000 years ago. I would highly recommend it, but be warned, it's eerie and I tend to believe Native Americans painted those petroglyphs as warnings of some sort. From there we hopped back onto I-70 and through Green River and then south on 24, which actually takes you right past Goblin State Park. It was about two in the morning by the time we got to Goblin and my girlfriend was asleep with my dog Cookie in the back of my truck. So I decided to pull over to take a little break and stretch my legs. So I pulled over to the side of the road and got out to have a toke. And that's when I noticed something was off. It was too quiet. The night was too still. Just then, a deer ran out of the brush and nearly gave me a heart attack. Laughing a bit, I took a few steps out into the darkness so as to not wake up my ex. I unzipped to go and that's when I heard my dog growling from the back of the truck. Cookie, cookie, I whispered. Hush, it's just me. Come look over here, baby. What the? My girlfriend's voice from out in the shadows. But when had she gotten out of the truck? And why hadn't I noticed her walk past me? Lauren, I said, walking towards the voice. Come look over here, baby, she said again. Lauren, are you okay? What's going on? I asked. Cookie's low growl then turned into a ferocious bark which actually snapped me out of my trance. And that's when I heard Lauren, the real Lauren, from back at the truck. Connor? She said in a half-sleep state. If that's Lauren, then who? I was knocked flat on my back, and I looked up to see what looked like a half-lady, half-coyote creature peering down at me. Her eyes were somehow beautiful, with a soft white glow to them that reminded me of winter. Her nose was long and looked like a coyote, but without the fur, and she had long white teeth protruding out from her mouth. She had two tall pointy ears on the top of her head, and she appeared to be wearing a coyote pelt around her shoulders. She tilted her head to the side before opening her mouth, revealing a row of dagger-like teeth. Her lower jaw was hanging down in an unnatural angle and she looked like she was making it bigger to bite my head off or something. That's when Cookie came bolting out of the back of the truck, slamming into the creature with some considerable force, knocking her off me. That's when I saw the rest of her body. She was long, at least six feet, and she had a full bushy tail, but her hands and feet were those of a human woman. Her body was wrapped in furs, but you could see black and red stripes painted on her naked body in between the patchy pelts. She then started to kick Cookie off of her and ran off into the bush. I ran over to make sure Cookie was okay, and thank God she was. I scooped her up and ran back to the truck. We gotta go, I said stumbling up to the driver's seat. We peeled out onto the road, and I started driving way too fast. Forty. 50, 60, which is when I hit a cow. That's right, I hit a cow. Apparently, there was a whole herd of cattle crossing the road, 
Lucky for us, I just barely clipped her head right as she started across the road. The poor cow then started to heave, but I knew I couldn't just leave her there in agony. I then got out of the car to cut her throat with this big knife I got from a gas station. And that's when I saw her. The skinwalker was back. She had followed us, and it was most likely her that had spooked the cattle out into the road in the first place. The rest of the herd took off, and then it was just me, her, and the dying cow on the road. Cookie was going nuts in the back of the truck, and I could hear Lauren gasp as this coyote lady, creature, took a step towards us with her lower jaw still hanging down from her face and her eyes reflecting the light from the headlights. Just then, another car came up over the rise and the coyote lady looked up and I swear it felt like she was staring straight into my soul before letting out a blood curling scream and leaping off the road back into the night. The other car pulled up and as luck would have it, it was a BLM ranger who had seen us hit the cow. She pulled out her service Glock and put the poor cow out of her misery. I then told her what happened, but she told us it was most likely a koi wolf, a coyote wolf hybrid that's new to the region. Lauren was in a state of shock and I didn't want us to get taken off to the loony bin. So I took the ticket for hitting a cow out on open range and we drove to Hanksville where we got a room for the night. I couldn't sleep a wink. Every time I closed my eyes, I just kept seeing her. And those eyes, those glowing, hypnotic, and yet somehow wild, elegant eyes. I often wonder since then who this woman was. What was she doing out there? Does she fully shift from coyote to woman? Or is she always like that? I have so many unanswered questions. I kind of want to go out and try to find her again. I just can't stop thinking about her. Sometimes I have dreams about her. What do you think? Should I try to go and find her? Let me know. Upon a recent discussion with an alumnus from a previous supply caravan to Black Mesa on the Navajo Res, it has come to my attention that one of the gals who accompanied the caravan a couple years ago had a very curious experience. I was able to get her contact info. Let's call her Amanda and we'll interview her about her encounter. In an effort to be respectful of the culture and the taboo nature of the subject matter, we decided to change the names and category of whatever this is that she experienced down there. Just a bit of background, there is a company called Peabody Coal Mining, which leases tracts of land in and around Black Mesa, and the landscape is one of shadow topographical relief marked by dry draws and arroyos which are essentially dry creek beds that flood during periods of heavy rain, which, granted, is not a very common occurrence in the high deserts of Arizona. This is what Amanda said. I was trying to retrieve a lamb who had escaped from the enclosure one afternoon. When I turned around, I couldn't seem to retrace my steps back to, quote-unquote, Johnny's compound where his parents' hogan is located. I was following one of the arroyos, hoping it would lead me to a road. That's when I started having asthma. I think that I started hyperventilating and had a full-blown panic attack because I lost consciousness. And when I came to it, it was nighttime. I stood up and looked around. I heard something like a twig snapping behind me and turned around to look in the pale moonlight. I thought I saw something duck behind a tree. It looked like the dark shape of a person who had been peering around the tree, but then withdrew when I noticed it. But I could tell that it was still there. So, I called out. Hello? Silence. Hello? Is someone there? 
I'm with the Colorado caravan. I... I think I'm lost. I laughed nervously. Can you help me? After a moment or so, this figure peered back around the tree. Only this time, it looked like my friend Charlie from the caravan. The figure then stepped out from behind the tree and motioned me to follow, thinking that Charlie had been sent to bring me back to camp and still feeling a bit confused. I started to follow the figure back up the draw. We've been walking for maybe five to ten minutes when another figure seemingly materialized from the shadows out in front of us. I felt a bolt of pain, like a severe migraine, and had to stop. When I looked up, there were three more figures, and they were standing in a semicircle before me. Now these things did not look human at all, but rather like large coyotes, and I could see ten eyes looking back at me in the dim silvery light. I started to stumble back, but the coyotes made no move to follow as I turned to run away. I ran for maybe five minutes before I stopped to catch my breath. That's when I heard another twig snap and looked back to see one of the coyote shaped silhouette up on the ridge line from back towards the direction from which I had ran. To my horror, the coyote appeared to stand up on its hind legs and let out a bone, chill and scream. I heard other people describe this before, but it almost sounded like a coyote howl magnified through a megaphone and then distorted with a heavy reverb like sound effect. My head was pounding but I truly fell in fear for my life so I kept running. Eventually I came to a service road and was able to flag down a Peabody mine worker who was driving down the road in a work vehicle. I convinced him to give me a ride and told him our caravan leader Buck could explain the situation to his manager if need be. As I climbed into the cab and we started driving, I looked in the rear view mirror and saw those eyes reflecting the red brake lights from the back of the truck. I don't think they followed us, but I couldn't be sure. So when the mine worker dropped me off at the compound, I ran into Johnny's parents Hogan, which is a big no-no for non-natives but I didn't know where else to go and I was still very scared. Johnny's parents only spoke Denye, but I was finally able to express the gist of what happened in between broken sobs and sniffling. I saw Johnny's father's face go pale as he realized what I was trying to say. He quickly shushed me and went to look out the window. Johnny's mom went to the stove and collected a small pan of ashes. She then dumped out on the table and started dipping bullets into them, loading them into a 357. She was singing what I can only assume was a Denia prayer for protection and looking worried at me. They let me sleep inside and nothing more happened that night. In the morning they called the medicine man to come and pray over me. We still had a couple nights left but decided to call the trip short after that. Johnny said not to worry, that the walkers wouldn't bother them anymore now that we were leaving and that he was just glad that I was okay. Suffice to say, I won't be going on any more caravans anytime soon. I know everyone says not to go searching for these things these skinwalkers well I can't tell you how much I regret not heeding that advice now I spent a considerable amount of time on the Navajo Res in the past so I thought I knew what I was doing it's actually not that hard to find a skinwalker if you know what you're looking for and if you do certain things they'll come to you as long as you're in one of the active areas such areas are in the path of the skinwalker, as it were, where a local clan of skinwalkers will come together to hold counsel and carry out their various rites and rituals and plan their evil doings. Cayenta, Arizona 
It's a town on the Navajo Nation at the intersection of Highway 160 and Highway 163. There's a pizza place there called Pizza Edge. Nearby is a car wash and a gas station, as well as a couple other little fast food restaurants. The whole area is just dirt, except for the mentioned highways, which are paved. Anyways, I mention this because that's about all there is to Cayenta. That plus a high school and a couple small hotels, a church, a post office, and a grocery store. The houses consist mainly of Navajo style hoguns and double wide trailers. It all started in that small downtown area next to the pizza edge. As soon as I pulled into the small dirt parking lot, I noticed a Navajo man and a dog sitting in the shade. The man appeared to be asleep, but the dog was looking right at me, only its eyes were strange, vaguely human somehow. It was starting to get dark, so I went in to grab a slice of cheese pizza. When I returned, the dog was next to my car, standing on two legs and trying to get in my open windows. I shouted at the dog and it dropped back to all fours and scampered off. I didn't see the man anywhere, so I got in my car and drove out of town a couple of miles to find a place to park for the night. I had a garbage bag with which I had collected some roadkill along the way. I had found a dead coyote, a couple skunks, a raccoon, and a fox. I placed the dead animals out in a field where two natural draws met to form an open space next to a small pond. I had a hot cup of coffee and I was ready to stay up all night if need be. At some point, however, I did fall asleep and woke with a start when I realized it was the middle of the night and someone or something was walking around my car. I grabbed my flashlight and shined it out the window. Boy, do I wish I hadn't done that. There was that dog again, except it was walking on two legs, peering in at me. I froze up. I couldn't move a muscle. The dog was breathing on the window, causing it to fog up in the light. Its eyes just looked wrong, like a human's eyes in the face of a dog. I jumped into the driver's seat and tried to start the car, but the engine wouldn't turn over. That thing was trying to open the door, and I could hear it scratching its claws along the side of my car. Finally, the engine turned over, and I was able to start the car. I hit the gas and sped out of there like a bat out of hell. I could see that dog thing in my rear view mirror, still running on two legs, before dropping back down onto all four legs and veering off into the night. I don't know what I was thinking, but that experience really scared me. Don't go looking for these things. They're out there, and they might just have you for dinner. I never told this story to anyone, and I don't really intend to tell it again. I have a pounding migraine today and this thread has kept me good company as I drifted in and out. I actually don't like talking about this time in my life. When I was around 12, I lived with my mom. We were below the poor level. We lived up in the mountains around Santa Cruz, California. My mom had a friend that owned a large bit of property up there, and he let us stay in a trailer up there. Our trailer was very small and was right beside a garden. A chain link fence ran around the garden to keep the dog the owner had out, along with other animals. All kinds of deer and things are very common in the area. Also, along the fence area was a single room. It was like a tiny house, but it was only a single room on the inside. This room had light, and since our actual trailer didn't, I spent a lot of my time in there. By the way, Sorry that the story will be fairly long. I'm actually pretty bad at writing. I just want to say that first, as this will be the only time. So there's this one thing you should know right now. 
This small fenced-in area was only a small part of the property, but most of it was just a bunch of woods. Also, I refused to leave the fence area because the owner's dog had been mistreated by children in the past and was very sketchy towards me all the time. If I was alone, it would try to bite at me, even through the fence. The fence was tall, at least seven feet high, and wasn't even movable. So as long as the gate was closed, I was safe. With that being said, there is no one else around us for miles and miles. Now I'm telling you all this because I think it's important that you understand what kind of scene this was before I really get into the story. So we have a fenced in location that seems fairly safe. It contains a trailer and a single room with power that is not connected to the trailer. Nothing else around for miles. My mom's van is parked out in front of the gate to the fenced in area and a single unpaved road runs from this garden for about a mile to the main house. Now then, I would bring friends up there to sleep over here and there. We all thought it was pretty cool, you know. Besides, we would get our own room to stay in to play video games all night long. It was like a dream come true. The only downside was simple. When it would get dark outside, it would get really dark. No city around and the trailer would not be lit up. There was no bathroom to use in the room and you would have to walk through the dark garden in order to get to the trailer to use it. Strange things would happen out here from time to time. It was always something that could be somewhat easily explained away though. Noises like people working at night or once me and a friend were sitting out in the garden and we saw a shadow as big as a small bear bound up a tree, but the tree didn't shake like there was weight on it. The dog also creeped me out, but you know, angry dog, and I was a kid, it happens. Now, I do get scared pretty fast, I always been that way. For example, I have trouble walking through a lit house if I'm alone. My friends, however, tend to be more outgoing just the kinds of people I get along with. This time, I had a friend over. His name was Jacob. We were staying up all night and playing Sonic the Hedgehog 3 on my Sega Genesis. We started playing as the sun went down and by the time we were finishing up the game, it was around 2 a.m. That's when we heard it. We turned off the game getting ready to find something else to play. There was a rumbling in the woods behind the room we were in, like somebody was rolling something really heavy around. We hadn't heard it before, because the noise from what we were playing was loud. I immediately got goosebumps. Jacob was not really worried about it, but it's not like there was someone else's house a yard right over there. It was just a forest, for miles, and it sounded like someone was constructing something or some shit, dragging and rolling something really heavy. Eventually, Jacob convinced me to just play some more games. I agreed on the condition that we turned the volume down so we could hear if something happened. We started playing, and I didn't even notice that the noise had stopped because I was into the game. A couple hours later, Jacob said he had to use the bathroom. I was feeling fine by then. So I was fine when he left to the trailer to relieve himself. He was taking a while, so eventually, I decided I was going to go check on him. Besides, I could use the bathroom and grab a snack while I was at it. I got up and opened the door to leave. And when I opened it, he was just standing at the doorway. Right outside the door, facing it. It scared the shit out of me. That's when I asked what he was doing, and he just stood there, blocking the exit. I realized he must have sneaked up to the door because I could hear him walk away from the room, but I hadn't heard him walk back up to it. It was super quiet out there, without the noises of the city. I should have been able to hear, but he refused to say anything or respond. He just stood there. I told him he was really creeping me out, 
But it wasn't like him to try to scare me like this. Finally, I decided to just go to the trailer and use the bathroom myself. I told him what I was going to do. Then I moved past him. But when I pushed him out of my way a little, his skin felt freezing to the touch. I jumped a little, but it was a cold night and he had been standing out there for like 30 minutes. So I figured that was to be expected. I walked as quickly as I could over to the trailer and that's when he followed me, like right on my tail. It was unnerving. I joked a little, saying that he already surprised me by scaring me at the door. The joke is over already. Finally, I got to the trailer and walked in. He didn't follow. He just stayed at the doorway. Now, I want you to picture this. Imagine inside a trailer with the door open in the middle of the night and your friend is just standing outside a trailer looking in. I checked on my mom who was fast asleep. Then I turned to go into the bathroom. It was a portal potty and we keep the bathroom door shut because it smells bad. When I reached for the door and tried to open it though, it was locked. That's when I heard a nervous voice come from behind the door. Um, in here. I quickly turned to look at Jacob, but the door was still open and there was nothing there but pitch black night. I froze. I would have heard the bathroom door open if he had come in behind me and gone that way. There is no way to do it quietly. That's when I just yelled out so loud that my mom woke up. I stared at the doorway unable to bring myself to move a muscle. She got up, walked over there, and looked out. Not seeing anything, she closed the door and asked me what was wrong. By now, Jacob was coming out of the bathroom and acting perfectly normal, but just a little bit confused. I explained what happened. And Jacob said he was just taking a long time in the bathroom, basically. None of them believed me at all, no matter how much I insist. My mom is sure that I just got sleepy and imagined it. And Jacob thought I was trying to prank him. So my mom gets out a big flashlight and walks us back to the room. She tells us to go to sleep. Then she leaves and goes back to the bed herself. Now, this room doesn't have any windows or anything so after a while I calm back down a little bit I'm telling myself that my mom was right it must have been like a waking dream or something meanwhile Jacob insists that he was in the bathroom the whole time and I'm inclined to believe him because there is just no way to really get around without being heard so I settled down but I'm a little rattled but I'm thinking that I can just sleep it off throughout the night. Suddenly, the dog starts going nuts, right behind us. The room is up against the fence, so the dog must have been like right behind the room on the other side. I guess when the dog started going nuts, I got scared because Jacob started laughing at me and said, the dog barking at a squirrel or some shit and you're over here shitting yourself. It keeps going like that for a long time though. Suddenly, the barking stops and gets replaced by whimpering. We hear the dog run away. There's about 45 seconds of silence before we hear something new. A small stretching sound on the back wall of the room. We both try to be silent as we can. Eventually, it stops. After five or so minutes of silence, Jacob decides to be brave. He decides that he's going to wake up my mom to tell her something crazy is going on. I wish he wouldn't leave me alone, but there's absolutely no way I'm going to go out there. He arms himself as best as he can with a tennis racket we had in the room with us. Then he takes a couple small steps and opens the door and dashes out. I close it as quick as I can behind him. In less than 30 seconds, I hear a scream. Not long after, the door flies open, and he comes back in looking pale as a ghost. He looks tired and his breathing is like he just ran a marathon. 
His eyes look as big as dinner plates. I then ask what is going on like four times before he finally starts getting words out. He tells me he walked out there and he was walking through the garden as quick as he could. And then he saw my mom just standing there. He tried to talk to her, but she stared at him with a blank expression. Getting super creeped out because of what happened to me earlier. He took a couple more steps towards her, telling her that he thought something was in the woods. Suddenly, her face turned to an awkward smile. Then he realized something terrible. He hadn't noticed sooner because of the darkness. She was on the other side of the fence. Now, the door to this room does not lock. And as I explained earlier, this room had no windows. As he is telling me what happened, he is also at the same time putting stuff in front of the door. And by the end, I was helping him. In retrospect, whatever was harassing us seemed to not want to actually enter the room or the trailer. Because the Jacob one didn't come into the room or to the trailer itself. Either way, we stacked everything we could against the door, thinking somehow, like in cartoons, this would actually definitely keep the creature out. So for the rest of the night, we heard scratches coming from all around the room. I, of course, ended up crying. Jacob looked like his mind had left his body with fear. At one point, whatever was out there was speaking as well. I heard it from right next to me where I was resting against the wall, in my mother's low voice, the same exact phrasing she had used earlier in the night. What's, What's wrong? wrong? Followed by, go to sleep. The sun must have come up eventually. The scratching as well stopped. We heard my mom come to get us. This time, we actually heard footsteps. We of course refused to leave the room. My mom had to go get the property owner and have him take the door off. When we saw that it was actually her, I burst into tears again. We never had any experiences like these again, and we eventually moved away. But that one night still haunts me. I still refuse to go out at night, unless I'm with a bunch of people. And I will never, ever live in the woods again. Anyways, I hope you all enjoy hearing about this, as I probably won't tell the story again. Thanks for listening. When I was 23, I had a security gig at a dairy farm in Ohio. It was a modest place only holding a few dozen cows at any given time. My then co-worker, a 34-year-old recovering meth addict named Corey, had just been fired for letting a cow go missing on his watch. An offense that would get you fired in every sense of the word. For starters, Corey was insane. By the time we met, he was seriously addicted to all kinds of drugs, and it rendered him virtually schizophrenic. Long nights were spent with him during my training period. He would tell me about the CIA and how they were out to get him. He was convinced that they were broadcasting thoughts into his head and that they would stop at nothing to ruin his life. More than once, I would catch him glancing over his shoulder or peeking out of windows with a dumb look on his face, hoping to catch a glimpse of whoever was following him. That's the type of person that Corey was. Each of our cows had an ear tag labeled with a number. At 8 p.m., they were each to be guided into their own respective stalls and locked in for the night. Padlocks became the norm after an incident with local kids a few years earlier. In the mornings, we would have to carry around a clipboard containing each lock combination and individually release each one. It was the most annoying way to start the day, but the cows were more secure that way. That's what made Corey's story so unbelievable. He had claimed that the previous night, cow number 29 had been locked away in her stall along with the others. He told us that the only thing out of the ordinary that night was a bat stuck in the rafters that he planned to deal with in the morning. 
In order for his claim to be true, an intruder would have unlocked the barn with a set of keys, unlocked 29 stall with the correct combination, then reset the locks and leave undetected. Either that or they picked up a 1600 pound animal and leaped through a window. Considering Corey's nasty habit of abandoning his duties in order to twitch and hallucinate in the corner, a small part of me believed that some two-bit thief might have been able to get one over him. My boss, however, a 50-year-old hothead, concluded that Corey must have been involved with the cow's disappearance and kicked him to the curb. With nobody else to fill his position, my boss had offered to pay me extra for each of his duties that I could complete until we received a new hire. Naturally, I agreed. I would be heading back to school in a few weeks and needed all the money I could get. My first night back at work began normally. Since I would now be doing the work of two security guards, I would arrive early to get a head start on Corey's checklist. I started out by sweeping out the barn. Farmhands tried to keep the TMR in a long pile just in front of the stall door so the cows could eat throughout the night but that shit practically painted the floor by the time I got there. Midway through, I noticed something reflective in the corner of the barn. I swept a loose bit of corn and hay over it to investigate. On the floor before me was a neon yellow ear tag, and I picked it up to examine it. 29. Next to 29's ear tag were the skeletal remains of a bat. I guess that was just another thing that Corey never got around to dealing with. I swept up the bones along with the rest of the barn. By the time I finished it was already 8pm. I made my way out to the fields and one at a time I guided each cow to its assigned stall. I got through about 10 or so before I noticed something strange. Across the field, about 50 meters away from everything else and all the others, was a cow alone. It faced away from me, seemingly transfixed on a nearby cornfield. Seeing a cow on its own is nothing strange, as they sometimes need personal space the same way as people do. What was strange though, was the way that her tail stuck straight out from behind her, unwavering. She stood as if she were afraid to slip, with her feet planted far apart. Perhaps the strangest of all, her head appeared to be tilted at a 90 degree angle. I was then eager to tell my boss they had already put down so many sick cows before, but losing two in the matter of a week might have been enough to send them over the edge. That's when I decided to save that cow for last, as I continued to guide the rest of them inside for the night. Being in charge of twice the amount of cows I was used to was time consuming. It took me nearly an hour to round them up. By the time I locked number 36 for the night, it was 9 o'clock. I should have been making my rounds by then, especially given the circumstances. I just had that last cow to deal with. When contemplating how long it was going to take me to unlock each cow in the morning, I realized something that made my blood run cold. The only stall left empty was number 29. I shuffled to the field, and surely enough, she was there. She hadn't moved an inch since I started the process of moving them. I approached her slowly. It was surreal seeing a creature frozen in such an odd position. As I came up on her, I could hear a definite, but muffled, chittering. It was unlike any noise I had ever heard from a cow. What the fuck did you eat? I thought to myself. I whistled to the cow before approaching her to avoid scaring her. On a dime, the chittering ceased. The cow's left ear rose to face the sky and began to oscillate like the periscope of a submarine. I could tell that moving this one would be a challenge. I rubbed her back attempting to calm her down. Bonding is key when establishing any sort of relationship with an animal. I had never interacted with 29 before, so we were unfamiliar with each other. Her skin felt bizarre, like clay with hide draped over it. I walked around to see her face. Her eyes were peeled open, darting around. Her mouth hung open and drooped to the side. I examined her left ear searching for a place to reinsert her tag. 
but there was no piercing. I strapped the halter to 29's mouth and began to lead her. It was like trying to uproot a tree with a bike chain. Each tug that I gave was useless. I began to put my weight into it. But still, no luck. When I say no luck, I don't mean that 29 wouldn't follow me. I mean that her body shows zero sign of being affected by my body weight whatsoever. Cows are strong creatures, but they're not made of stone. I was perplexed. After 15 minutes of this, I decided that it was useless to continue on with the clock ever ticking. I could no longer afford to neglect my rounds. I began to walk to the security post to collect my flashlight and get on with the night. I heard a slow trotting. I looked behind me to see that the cow had in fact moved. 29 was now facing me. Not so shy now, I wonder. I turned around and continued walking towards the gate. When I made it halfway through the field, I began to hear the trotting again, but this time it was louder and much quicker. I smiled to myself, wish I would have known to walk away sooner. Without turning to face the cow, I walked into the barn and began fumbling with 29's padlock. 3 left, 32 right, 23 left. As the lock clicked open, I heard the floorboards behind me creak, a slow, vocal noise turned to a sickly gurgle. I hope to God whatever you got isn't contagious, I said before spinning around. All color drained from my face as I was greeted with the sight of the eight foot tall beast standing before me on its hind legs. Its ears were flapping like a hummingbird's wings. Its head was cocked sideways with one eye focused on me. Its pupil seemed to grow and shrink as it scanned over my entire body, its lower jaw slowly moved up and down as it began to vocalize again. It began to creep towards me. Its front legs were kicking as it attempted to keep balance, all the while making that same noise. I began to feel lightheaded. I grabbed 29's padlock and made a break for the door. That's when the cow began to stomp behind me. I began to hyperventilate as I sprinted. The rest of the cows were spooked, shaking and jumping around as well. I slammed the door shut and clasped the padlock. A sickening boom shook the entire wall of the barn as 29 began to claw at the door. Oh, oh, oh. The beast croaked before chittering once more. I backed away from the door slowly, its wooden frame bending and contorting at the sheer force behind it. Without another warning, I turned my back to the barn and ran to my car as 29 began wailing and pounding. I never ended up making any rounds that night. Instead, I started my car and left that fucking place in the rear view mirror. I didn't even tell my boss. In fact, I avoided several of his phone calls because I had nothing to say. I figured it would be best if I just quit the easy way. There are certain things in life that back you into corners. Silence forces your hand, you know. That's why I'm writing this now. I still wanted my money. A few weeks later, just before making my two hour drive back to college, I stopped by the farm to pick up my final check. My boss wasn't in his office on Tuesdays, so I took advantage of the situation and granted myself access with the key that I had seen him kick under the rug once or twice. After snagging my check and a few Jolly Ranchers, I got in my car and slowly began to drive away. Out of the corner of my eye, a young farmhand standing in the grazing field caught my attention. I lowered my window and said, Hey kid, stay away from the night shift. But he didn't answer me, nor even look at me. He just continued to stare at the pile of bones before him. As I kept driving, I kept staring at him, and he wouldn't even move an inch. That's when something struck me as odd. His head was tilted sideways, similar to 29's head. I swear, I'm never going back to that farm again. Before I begin, 
I would like to say that this is a very long story. It's been something that's haunted me since I was six years old. Since my first encounter with it, I had dreams about this and two very specific encounters with the creature. I'm sharing this story so I could possibly find help on what to do or how to get rid of this creature that's been hunting me since I can remember. Just for background, I'm a 21 year old female and still worry about this creature finding me, but I'll get into detail why later. For now, here's my story. I would always go camping with my grandparents, who I call my gammy and gampy at the end of my school years. I would always look forward to it since I grew up loving the outdoors and the woods. I especially loved camping, loving the idea of having s'mores, taking long hikes, being around the campfire, and of course the wildlife that we would see. Now, I grew up in California, mostly near cities, so the forest was like my true home to me. I always prefer being near trees and dirt instead of buildings and crowded places. Besides, the woods were more quiet and more peaceful. I always felt safe when I was there, like nothing could ever hurt me. But something strange would always happen at the end of the month of May. I would have this reoccurring dream during the last week of my school year. I would be in the woods, walking alone, down a dirt trail. The woods were always quiet. I would continue to walk this path until I saw this red fox poke its head from behind a tree. Its eyes were always strangely human-like, but they were yellow and somehow looked like teddy bear eyes. And it would always just stare at me. It wouldn't make a sound at all. It would just watch me. Usually, in my dream, I would go up and pet it, making the fox finally make a noise, mostly a soft growl. Then I would continue walking, and it would follow me. The first time I would have this dream was when I was actually around five years old, and it lasted until I was about 11. As the years went by, it would be the same exact thing. I would walk in the woods, find this fox, pet it, then continue on with my hike with it alongside me. But when I was having the same dream on the fourth time, it would start to walk behind me. That's when I started to feel uneasy about this fox. I could hear it making odd noises, but every time I went back to look, it was just walking like nothing was wrong even somehow giving me a smile. Sorry to go on about a dream, but I now believe that this was a warning of the creature. Now that the dream is out the way, I can talk about my first true encounter. I was six years old and I was going on a camping trip with my gammy and gampy for about a week. Of course, I was very excited. I was barely able to keep myself in school for the last day of kindergarten. They had picked me up right as the bell had rung and already had the camping trailer attached to my Gampy's truck. I remember he drove an old red truck that only had three seats with me being always in the middle. It took about two hours to get there and another good hour to find our usual camping spot. It was deep into the woods and far from other people as my gammy wasn't too fond of being around other people while we were camping. As they were setting up the camping trailer, I wandered around the campsite, loving to dig in the dirt for bugs. I had sat down on the dirt and started to dig, but I noticed how quiet the woods were. It was never quiet, not even in the dead of night. I thought it was odd, but being only six, I didn't think too hard about it. As I continued to dig for bugs, however, I thought I heard my gammy call for me. She would always call me Sugar Booger. That being a nickname she gave me since I was born. That's what I had heard. 
but it sounded like she was very far away and somewhat sick. Trigger burger. I looked up where I heard it coming from, which was from the woods, but there was no way she was there because she was still unloading stuff from the truck. Even at the age of six, it didn't feel right. So I walked closer to my grandparents and stayed next to them. I soon forgot about this weird encounter I had as we began to have fun. For the rest of the day, we played card games, sat next to the campfire as we ate dinner and stared up into the stars. I always loved seeing the stars. There was never any where I lived at. We started to get sleepy around 9 p.m., I believe, and we started to get ready for bed. There were bunk beds that me and my gammy would sleep on, keeping our luggage on the top bunk, and we would sleep on the bottom bunk. Due to my gampy snoring, he would sleep on the couch of the trailer. I would always sleep next to the trailer window, just in case I couldn't sleep and wanted to look outside. I fell asleep pretty quickly though, that being the last day of school and all, it was pretty exhausting. I remember waking up maybe hours later. It was still pitch black outside. It wasn't weird for me to wake up late in the night since I always had sleeping issues. I rolled onto my side trying to fall back asleep until I heard my eyes immediately shot open as I heard my nickname being spoken but I knew it wasn't either of my grandparents. They were both asleep and they were never known to sleep talk before. I started to feel this horrible feeling in my gut, like whatever I was hearing wanted to really hurt me. Even at the age of six, I knew this wasn't normal. Then I started to hear tapping at the trailer window. It was soft, but loud enough for me to hear it. I just sat there, frozen in fear. I was trying to just brush it off as tree branches or rain, but I just knew it wasn't it. I could tell it was really someone or something tapping on the window. Then I decided to be brave and look. Big mistake. I pulled the curtain away to only peek and all I saw were these large yellow eyes. They seemed glassy yet not real. They looked like giant teddy bear eyes, but cold and unwelcoming. I remember in that moment, I panicked and quickly closed the curtain back up. I then hid under the blanket, that being the only thing I knew to do when I saw a monster. I could feel tears falling down my face. I never had been so terrified in my life. I just curled up into my gammy side and clung to her all night long. That damn tapping only getting louder and more persistent throughout the night. I don't remember falling asleep, but somehow I did. I do remember my gampy waking me up around noon, saying how if I got up quick enough, we could still go fishing, but I didn't want to leave the trailer at all. Terrified that whatever I saw the night before would still be out there. I did eventually go outside but I was just looking around, horrified that whatever saw me last night would get me. My gammy immediately knew I was scared and pulled me into a hug when she saw me, asking me what was wrong. I did tell her what I saw and heard, and to my surprise, she believed me. The next thing I know, she was telling my gampy that we were moving campsites. It took a bit to convince him, but he did eventually start to pack up and hooked the trailer onto his truck. I was put into the truck so I could fall asleep, but I just couldn't. I kept feeling that I was being watched, thinking that every little noise was that thing I saw, that if I closed my eyes even for a second, it would get me. My gammy wasn't too far from me when I heard it again, but this time it was my actual name. Aaliyah. In that moment, I had never seen my gammy move so fast. She looked up into the bushes where we heard it. 
then to me. She then got in the truck with me and pulled me into a tight, protective hug. I began to cry all over again, telling her how I wanted to just go back home. That's when my gampy got into the truck as well. And since I was crying so hard to the point I was coughing, he agreed we could go home. We started to head out the campsite, still hurt that this trip had been ruined by something. But I still didn't know what. That's when something in my head told me to look back. I slowly did, feeling an ice cold fear wash over me as I saw something, a red fox, sitting in the middle of the campsite, sitting there with large yellow eyes, the same red fox from my dream, somehow curling its lips into an eerie smile. After that encounter, we never did go back to that campsite. We did continue to camp, but in more populated areas. I never told my grandma what I saw, but she had told me to trust my gut. She knew that I was sensitive to certain entities, and that would help me if I trusted it. Now, this would be the end of the story, but I'm afraid it isn't. There was one more encounter I had with the creature, and it was much more terrifying than the first time. The second encounter I had was when I was 17, many years later. By this time, I knew very well what a skinwalker was now, and I was still very paranoid every time I went near wooded areas. I still worried about seeing that fox, but I never really thought about it too much. Me and my two younger siblings were staying at a relative's house for Christmas, them living way up into a mountain area. I think they were my great aunt and uncle, but I'm not sure. Where they lived, there was no service at all. So unless we hooked up into their Wi-Fi, we had no phone. I didn't mind the house. I was still loving the woods no matter what happened. Even though at night, I hated how they didn't close the window curtains, making it easy for anything outside to see inside. But I did feel safe while inside the house, knowing that they wouldn't let anything hurt us. Lucky for all of us, it didn't snow where they lived, so we could go outside and run around. They also had this beautiful black lab. She was about a year old, her name was Pam. She was very playful and normally wouldn't listen to anyone but my uncle. One of the days we were there, my little sister and our aunt went out to the store for a nice girl's day. Even though I'm a girl, I wanted to go hiking with my uncle and my little brother. We left pretty early since the hike we were doing was four hours of walking into town. It was a really chilly morning but since we were doing so much walking, it felt great. We also decided to take Pam. It was a good way for her to get some exercise and have fun. About maybe an hour into our walk, I started to slow down a bit, wanting to enjoy the beautiful forest. It was so peaceful, I could have stayed there. But as we continued to walk, I started to feel something odd. I noticed how quiet the forest had become. Hearing only footsteps and my brother talking to our uncle, Pam noticed it too. Her ears going straight up and growling softly. I started to pick up my pace to get next to my brother. I was worried that possibly a coyote or mountain lion was nearby, but I knew that they wouldn't be out at this time though. Even if they were, they didn't walk near the roads. My little brother was only nine at that time. And being the oldest sibling, my natural instincts to protect him kicked in. My uncle noticed the silence as well, telling us to stay close to him and Pam, who was now next to me and still growling. I began to feel that horrible feeling again, that ice cold fear I once felt when I was six. I tried so hard to not think of the creature, but it was all I could worry about. I was scared. I felt like I was back to being that scared little six year old girl again. I had to stop for a moment though, seeing my shoelace came undone. I quickly kneeled down to tie it back up, trying to hurry and just get out of there. And that's when I heard it. Aaliyah. 
In that moment, my heart dropped into my stomach. My eyes were widened, and I could just feel myself start to shake from fear. It was right next to me. I heard it clear as day. I slowly turned my head, and there it was. That same red fox still having those horrid yellow eyes and that same demented smile. Only this time, I saw it much more clearly. Its fur looked so matted and disgusting. The smell it had was like rotten, decaying flesh mixed with garbage. Its limbs were much too long for a normal fox. The back legs bending completely the wrong way. Those eyes were still the worst thing about it, but now they looked emptier than I had remembered. I wanted to scream, to run, to cry, but I just couldn't. I was frozen as I was, too scared to even blink. Then I heard it speak again. This time, however, it had mimicked my little brother's voice. Found you. Before anything else could happen, Pam suddenly jumped in front of me and started to bark like mad, snapping and growling so aggressively that it scared me out of my frozen trance. When I looked back, it was gone. I used that moment to run over to my brother and uncle, who didn't see what I saw, as they were too far ahead now. But I heard my uncle start to pray and sing a song under his breath, keeping my brother and myself close to him. I was just too scared to even look back, so I just kept my eyes on the ground and refused to stop walking. Pam had stopped barking, but she was still growling and never left my side as we continued our hike. My little brother was a bit worried, but he just thought it was a coyote. When we finally made it into town, my uncle had called our aunt and told her to pick us up, saying something about how it wasn't safe for us to walk back. Thankfully, she did come and get us, but she was confused since we talked about that hike for days. On the car ride back, Pam never left me alone. She was right with me the entire time. She knew that thing was after me, and she was protecting me. I was very grateful that she was with us. Who knows what would happen if she wasn't. When we got back to the house, I was talked to by my uncle and aunt. I told them what happened and what I saw, and then they started to pray and check that all the locks were shut tight. My aunt started putting something around the doors. I now believe it was most likely ashes, but I never did find out. Unfortunately, this made our Christmas vacation cut short as they were worried that I was not safe while still in the woods. We had to be taken home the next day. They made an excuse of how there was an emergency with a friend and that they had to help them out. I felt horrible that this Christmas was ruined, but once I did leave the woods, I truly felt safe again. Before they had to drive back home though, they told me that it wasn't my fault and that lucky for all of us, it didn't hurt me or the other kids. It did make me feel a bit better, but it still brought up a lot of questions and worries. It was still around. How? Why? What did it want from me? Does it want my skin? My soul? Was I just going to be tormented by this thing forever? I still don't have answers to these questions, and that's what really scares me. Now, I have long moved from California, and now live in Kentucky. I do live in the woods, but so far, that thing hasn't found me. I know that seems very stupid on my part, but life had changed a lot when I was growing up. I was given no other option to live somewhere else, and my grandpa in Kentucky was kind enough to let me live with him. So please don't call me an idiot for moving to the woods when I had no other choice. Anyways, I am happy it hasn't found me, but I'm still worried. Can it still find me? Is it still hunting me? I'm not close to anyone who knows truly on how to get rid of this thing. And that's why I'm telling my story now so I can possibly find help. So please, if there's anyone out there who does know, please.
help me. <laughs>